uh, race in America. And Tulsi Gabbard, uh, find, you know, one of the eight minutes that she that she actually got to respond to something um, what is where they uh, started the question um, about race in America, uh, which was good. It was like, okay, cool. Like you're actually giving. Uh, you know, a, a minority, a woman of color to, to respond to it. A woman of color that hasn't imprisoned a bunch of black people and said that mothers need to be in prison if they don't send their uh, kids to school, uh, which was Kamala Harris. She, she's the one that put that, put that fucking thing in place. Uh, so they asked Tulsi Gabbard, and Gabbard's response uh, was to take care of the issue of white supremacy, um, and correct the racial problems that are happening in this country, either institutional, uh, uh, on an institutional level, and to overhaul the, uh, the criminal justice system and get rid of the war on drugs, right? That's, that's one of the ways that we kind of uh, balance out the issue of race in this country. Uh, talking about prison and sentence reform. Um, she talked about uh, reforming, uh, you know, sentences and, and the prison system itself making it more about um, uh, rehabilitation than just about punishment. Uh, and uh, she's pushed for legislation in all of these things, which she has, especially for legalizing marijuana. She's pushed a bunch of legislation on a federal uh, uh, legalization of marijuana in all 50 states. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, and that, that has been kind of a, a little bit of a problem. Um, and, and she's put prison reform uh, legislation as well um, but on, on the war on drugs thing, like, we do know that was a, that was a Nixon plot. Like, it's not a real thing. Like, that's out in the open. Um, like, one of his, one of Nixon's advisors came out, and I, I talk about this in my stand-up sometimes, is, like, they came out, uh, this guy came out, John Ehrlichman, I think his name is, and he basically was like, oh yeah, we totally made that shit up to, like, destabilize any sort of activ- activist movements. Like, we totally fucking made that. So that, it was like a distraction. So we equated, like, marijuana with a bunch of fucking hippies and then uh, heroin with the black community so that it was, like, easy and cool for police to raid these people's home and destabilize the community so that they wouldn't, like, protest the war. Uh, So the war on drugs is completely bogus and it does affect uh, a lot of communities of color. Um, But it affects a lot of activist communities, too. Like, anybody that kind of says that we need to to legalize it. uh, And, 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 uh, you know, the push for federal reform that Tulsi has. um, I do think that we need a federal reform of marijuana. Because on a state-by-state level, uh, I understand there's a lot of people that are like, yeah, just let the states uh, deal with it on on, on their own. And... um, and, and take care of it. Look, people move around, for one. Uh, you know, like, I move around a lot, and, and it's, it's difficult and tiresome to figure out what the rules are in every single state, um, especially for something like this. Uh, you know, like, just in the states that it's illegal, some states might be, uh, some states might be a um, uh, uh, misdemeanor, uh, some states you're allowed to carry a certain amount. Some states it's a fed- it's like a five to seven year sentence. Uh, so federal, and then you, I've also seen like cases like in in Washington, Washington State, um, where people have a hard time uh, with with their landlords, right? Because you can grow and you can sell uh, if you would like to and, and register that and, you know, be taxed for, for, and, and run it as a business. Um, and then landlords like either raise the rent because that's how they're going to get a cut of this. Uh, or they, or they try to muscle their way into the business by saying, oh, well, you're running a business out of your home. Um, so, you know, like I deserve a cut of it for, for you living in the, in this, uh, in this apartment building and it becomes murky. That's a murky, murky thing that, uh, you know, I think if we federally legalize it, we can talk about, um, what, what that would look like if, if you ran a, uh, a marijuana growing and selling, uh, operation out of your home, if you made it into a home business, um, or do you have to get a place? 
you know, and what are the incentives uh, of of having a a, a, a registered uh, building that is specifically for the growth and sale of marijuana. Though those things, I think, would be much clearly addressed if it was done on a federal level, and that's what Tulsi Gabbard pushed for. She's also talking about not making prisons for profit to actually treat prisoners properly. Because we do have a huge issue of uh, recidivism in this country. It's, uh, uh, it, it, you know, it, it pushes more people back into prison. And, the, and then they don't get their rights back when they get out of prison, which is kind of bullshit, right? So it's like, even after you've served your time, even, even if you look at prison as a form of punishment, once you get out of prison, why is your sentence still carrying over? Like, you can't vote. It's more difficult for these folks to get a job, hold down jobs, find a place to live. Like, you know, there, there is, I think that's societal stigma that I think we need to get over, for one. And for two, it's, it's just, if these people can't participate in their society and participate in democracy and um, all, of, all of the things that are available to us in our society... Uh, you know what incentive do they have not to go back to the same same way of doing like we're, we're creating the same problems that led them to commit the crimes that put them in prison uh, and and all of that is primarily done so that you know the prison industrial complex can keep running the more prisoners they are there are the more money these corporations that own the prisons make right there like the companies get to keep lining their fucking pockets uh, even more um, so I think we do need that and I think I think sentence reform prison and sentence reform is something that's really important in that in that regard uh, because because we do need to like change what the prison system is we should be focusing on rehabilitation um, instead of just uh, kind of continuing to put psychological pressure on these people and uh, keeping them uh, keeping them away from society and not knowing what they're worth. Uh, Andrew Yang uh, talked about white defining white supremacy as domestic terrorism. Uh, I, okay, cool. I'm I'm not against that idea. Uh, I think there there could be more that's explored about that. Like, what does that mean if it's considered domestic terrorism? Like, what what do we what do we do about it? I think would be the next step. Um, and he kind of goes on into saying, you know, anyone that's al- alone and hurt uh, can be swayed by these by these groups. And that is what we see, right? Like, that's sort of also like the way that uh, terror groups like ISIS recruit people is, uh, is to convince you, like, if you are getting out of college and you're struggling to find a job and you're struggling to find uh, meaning and, um, you know, uh, like a place in society... Um, and and they come out and be like, yeah, your government's fucking dropped you, huh? Like, and yeah, you like they promised you all this shit, and then it, it didn't come through. So it's very it's very easy for people to get vulnerable in um, lonely, uh, difficult states of mind to be swayed by these uh, ideologies. I, I think I think it, it, it's it's easy to be swayed by um, by any ideology, right? Uh, and and particularly hate groups do prey on that kind of an mindset because because you're you're isolated you're not really you're not really getting that positive encouragement so his plan was to figure out um is to have some systems in place to encourage people um especially young men who uh end up getting isolated and joining um you know these hate groups or joining these terror cells and and uh, do, and, and then pursuing a, a line of violence, which I was like, that's great. That's awesome. That's what we should do. It's cool that you came up with a, like you, you have a plan, um, a community driven kind of idea um, to, to do it. Uh, and, and then uh, Biden talked about Me Too. <sighs> he talked about the uh, of Violence Against Women Act, which got almost no applause. Uh, that was kind of sad, and uh, uh, he talked about these virtual town hall meetings and and the cultural change that these people talked about. And I was like, okay, we get it, Grandpa. You know how to use the internet, right? <laughs> like that's kind of what that was. Um, and then he said he's punching at the issue of domestic violence, and I was like, oh man, Joe, you got like, come on, buddy, come on, dude. 
that's not the right way to fucking say it. You can't say punching something when you're talking about domestic violence, bro. That was just bad form. That was a big gaffe. I don't think anybody's really talked about how big of a gaffe that was. But it's just like, you can't fucking say shit like that. I get what you're trying to do. Uh, Like, it's that whole, like, take a bite out of crime, punch the domestic violence. Like, no, no. You know what people that have lived through domestic violence want less of? Punching. They don't want to punch anything. They want to be away from that. Your, your domestic violence plan should not involve more violence. That's a bad idea. What the fuck? Whoever's writing this shit down for them, like, they... Is it just like a fucking old marketing guy that's like, yeah, let's stay punching with punching, right? Like, it's... No. No. You shouldn't have more violence when you're trying to fight violence. It doesn't work. Doesn't work. Again, we're teaching Joe Biden math. It's called exponential. What you're doing is exponentially making the situation worse, Joey B. Oh. What a f- what fucking bad form. What fucking bad form. So then we moved on um, to uh, Harris criticizing uh, Mayor Pete on his commitment to black voters. Uh, And she brings up the fact that, like, the black voters have been taken advantage of and ignored by uh, by the uh, as constituents of the Democratic Party. Um, The black votes were placated to. And I was like, that's kind of funny uh, that she supported putting more black people in prison and now is just like, you're placating to the black vote. It's like, yeah, so the fuck are you, Kamala Harris? Weren't you the one that went on and was just like, yeah, I smoke some marijuana. I have Jamaican in my body, of course. Marijuana, Jamaicans, huh? Black people smoking the weed, smoking the reef reef. Like, the fuck are you talking about? You were like, oh, when I was in college, I was listening to Tupac and Biggie. When they were not rapping? <laughs> what did you do? Fucking go down and find, like... Th- like, did you go down there with a fucking tape recorder? And you're like, well, this, this young youth seems to sure be good. Like, what the fuck are you talking about? So, of course, Mayor Pete retorted to that. Uh, and he said he welcomes the challenge of connecting uh, to uh, black voters. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, like he's lived the problems of the community. But, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, like, uh, he, he understands the problems of black and low-income communities. Um, he has lived and breathed these aspects uh, of, uh, yeah, w- so have they. They've also lived and breathed the problems that you've created with the black and low-income communities by destroying homes and putting asbestos and type- uh, chemical toxins into the air. Like, they're literally living and breathing that shit, dude. Maybe you should finish the projects that you started. And then Harris kept going, well, justice is on the ballot. Justice is on the ballot, and that's how we're going to win. We're going to win with justice being on the ballot, not with you or not. I don't think justice is on the ballot with you. I think, I think your fucking record that you're so proud of has proved that shit to be true. So we moved on to, uh, then we moved on to Warren with her debt relief. Uh, and she said that's got to, that's, uh, will help close the gap between uh, 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 black people and white people in this country, right? The black white wealth cap. And that's probably true. Um, you know, I, I do think that that'll close it. But more importantly, I think that te- uh, the, if you're going to alleviate student loan debt, it just, it just, it helps like, circulate more money into the economy that we like people run I think mostly is what the idea is behind that people run the economy not not Wall Street and the to- stock market like the stock market is basically a popularity contest for rich people it's it's how well and how cool rich people are doing this week that's basically what the stock market is when we spend money uh, to help small businesses to um, help uh, you know community based organizations and things like that that's when the economy uh, gets stronger 
and uh, and that'll never happen if if all the wealth is, is stuck at the top and stu- uh, alleviating student loans I think is one way of um, uh, decreasing that um, and you know ra- race is a component of uh, the wealth gap it's a component of it hey thanks for watching this video uh, this is part of a little series I do called road reflections where I talk to you while I'm on tour uh, about the current socio-political environment current news stories uh, debates that sort of stuff that I don't get to talk about on my podcast taboo table talk or fork full of noodles it's a little bit looser and uh, I hope you guys enjoyed this clip. If you guys enjoyed it, uh, you can find the full episodes on my Facebook page. Uh, you can go like Krish Mohan, uh, social vigilante and comedian, and uh, hit the subscribe button, hit the like button, uh, share this out if you enjoyed it. Um, and another way to help uh, see more regular content is by becoming a patron over at patreon.com slash Krish Mohan. Thanks again, guys, and we'll see you on the road. Hey everybody, thank you so much for checking out this video. If you enjoyed the content that was discussed and the and the type of humor that you saw in this video, then you'll probably enjoy my live stand-up comedy show. I've got live shows coming up in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, Madison, Wisconsin, Bloomington, Illinois, Minneapolis, Minnesota, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, Columbia, South Carolina, New York City, Philadelphia. I'm going to be on tour uh, in in a whole bunch of places uh, at the end of 2019 and into 2020. Go to my website, ramennoodlescomedy.com for my entire tour schedule. That's R-A-M-A-N, noodlescomedy.com. Check out my entire tour schedule, get your tickets there, and uh, we'll see you on the road. Thanks again.